grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, as we look at the text for today from Matthew chapter 20, we're coming to the tail end of a group of texts where Jesus is helping his disciples understand the economy of the kingdom. Basically, how things work and what's valuable in the kingdom and what's not. It starts back in chapter 19 when Jesus explains that having wealth and an abundance of wealth or an abundance of possessions or good works doesn't necessarily mean that a person has eternal life. He then continues with the parable of the workers in chapter 20 in the vineyard where each worker received the same payment even though there were some workers who worked longer and some shorter basically showing that the length of work doesn't change what we receive at the end. Eternal life through grace, undeserved love. Which then brings us to the last teachable moment in his kingdom economy section from Jesus. And it deals with the understanding of what makes someone great. So let me ask you, what makes someone great? We might think of our sports heroes growing up. It, it might be the amount of championships they've won or the amount of records they hold or, or how clutch they were in key moments, right? We might think of musical artists or directors and, and how successful they are. There are lots of different things we use to determine greatness in our world. But generally speaking, it's something that makes the person stand out from the rest, right? That's greatness. And that understanding of greatness has really traveled well throughout time, hasn't it? Especially when we look at the disciples in our text from Matthew 20, especially verse 20. It says, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before Jesus, she asked him for something. And Jesus said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. Now, yes, I know it's James and John's mom coming to Jesus with his request, and not technically all of the disciples. But who do you think pushed her? Who do you think prodded this mother to ask the question of Jesus? And we know that because Jesus didn't address the follow-up question to their mother. He addressed it to James and John. So what is the measure of greatness for James and John? It's position. Right? Where they would sit in Jesus' kingdom, and even more than that, the power that would come from those positions. Now, obviously, this doesn't sit well with the other disciples, and it would be nice if it was because they had learned from the previous teachings about the economy of the kingdom and what really mattered. Spoiler alert, it wasn't. It was only because they wanted the, the power and the position that James and John were asking for. Power and position that in their minds would make them stand out from the rest. Would make them great. Now we can relate to the disciples, can't we? Because in each of us, whether we like it or not, there is somewhat of a desire for greatness. Whether it's being great at our jobs, great at finances, great at parenting, or just even being great at Jeopardy, right? A lot of different things with which we want to be great. Dear friends, that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to want greatness. But the question becomes, how do we define what makes us great in those areas? Is it our ability to do whatever it takes to climb the corporate ladder? Is it that we accumulate more wealth than others? Is it that we subjectively see ourselves as better parents than our friends, than other people? Is it that we can answer all the football category questions on Jeopardy when the real contestants can't? Yes to that one. But in all seriousness, where do all of these definitions lead us back to? Ourselves. Our own pride. Our own sin. Our own arrogance. Our own selfish ways. In other words, our desire for greatness often leads us back to a desire of self. And that's never a good thing, especially when there's another way. There is another way, according to Jesus, to define greatness, another way to stand out from the rest. Listen to what he says. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
Another way to illustrate what Jesus is talking about here is to ask the simple question, what makes Jesus great? We could point to the miracles, right? We could point to the teachings. But frankly speaking, there may be many things that speak to the greatness of Jesus, but the greatest of them all is simply the cross and the empty tomb. Jesus doing what he talked about here, not coming to be served, but to serve and give his life up for the disciples, for the people of the world, for you and for me. That is what makes Jesus truly great. Why? Because it stands out from the rest, doesn't it? It's not about arrogance or selfishness. It's not about pride. It's simply about God's own and only Son coming to this world, dying on the cross, rising from the dead to serve you because He loves you. And that is greatness, dear friends. To serve you and me, to sacrifice for you and me in the midst of our arrogance and pride. To pay the price so that we are no longer captives held in the prison of our selfishness, sin, and earthly understanding of greatness but rather forgiven children of God who no longer define or find greatness in serving ourselves, but rather have been set free to define and find greatness by serving others with the same undeserved love that Christ has shown to us. And if you want an example of what that looks like, look at our Child Development Center. There are many, many reasons why we have a great child development center, why it might stand out from the rest. Jan keeps a good budget. We have academic excellence. Our teachers are highly credentialed and professional. A lot of different ways that we can define greatness with our child development center. But you know, when Pastor Tom and I speak about the greatness of our school, we talk about it with a kingdom economy in mind. Mainly that when children come to our school, They not only get to experience God's greatness in Christ each and every day from our teachers, but they also get to learn about the greatness of our God in Christ each and every day for them. That is what makes our school so great. Because it's not about leading the children back to us. It's about leading them back to Jesus each and every day day. And so how about you? When you consider your greatness, whether it's as a neighbor, friend, employer, employee, student, wherever it may be that you are sent to serve, does it lead back to you or does it lead back to Jesus? It can be challenging when we're dealing with the economy of the world and the economy of the kingdom. But if you ever forget, look to the cross because there Jesus stands out from the rest, not just for you, but for the people of this world. So that as we share the message of the cross, they can define what true greatness looks like. They can see for themselves where true greatness is found. The cross of Jesus Christ for them today and always. Amen. Amen.